The Baltimore Ravens had Jadavian Clowney in for a visit on Tuesday, and we talk about why a Clowney and Baltimore pairing could be inevitable. That and more coming up next here on Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Ravens, where your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast here. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, and we're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I appreciate everybody who's tuning in today, making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day. We are free and available all podcasting platforms, including over in video form on YouTube. It's the same show, both audio form and video form. So to all the audio listeners, all the video watchers out there, thank you everyone for tuning in. We are, again, five days per week here, right around 6 a.m. Eastern times when our episodes come out, sometimes like now of my friends so it's a little bit later but we, we give your Ravens news analysis updates here and you can tell a friend to the family member spread the word about the show it, it helps us grow here on Locked on Ravens and also gets more Ravens fans involved in the community which means more content so we're going to be diving into a lot today because obviously the big news of Tuesday was that JV and Clowney visited the Ravens it's been a player that I think Baltimore's been plugged in with over the past couple of seasons. Obviously, he's never been a Raven, but we can go back to, I think it was 2020 when the Ravens tried to work out a sign-in trade and that whole situation happened. But I want to talk about why the signing might be inevitable this time around for the Ravens and for Clowney and what he would bring to the team if signed. Then in the second part of the show, we'll move into Tuesday's training camp notes. There was a lot to talk about Odo Beckham Jr. start, and that we'll talk about what he did in practice. And finally, I want to look at the first unofficial depth chart that the Ravens released. They put that out on Tuesday. And again, doesn't really mean a lot, but, you know, we can still take some stuff away. We, we can still talk about it. So we'll talk about it in the final part of the show. So let's dive into it. Let's talk about Jadavia and Clowney. If you listen to us on Monday, you listen to my show on Monday, I outlined some top pass rushing options for the Ravens after Justin Houston. The news broke that he had signed with the Carolina Panthers. And I had put Jadavian Clowney at the top of my list. I had said, you know, a guy like a Clowney, Kyle Van Noy, those are probably the top two guys left on the board. Now, Clowney's track record speaks for himself. He was the number one overall pick back in the 2014 NFL draft. Only played in four games his rookie season, didn't have a sack. And actually, it's funny because Clowney's a player that can play both inside and outside. Baltimore loves positional versatility. Clowney can play both as an outside linebacker or as a defensive end. He's played both over the course of his career. He played defensive end over the past two seasons in Cleveland, but in 2020 in Tennessee, that was a disaster year for him, in all honesty. Played outside linebacker in Seattle. He played defensive end, and then in Houston, he rotated between outside linebacker and defensive end. So Baltimore can opt to put him on the inside. They can also put him on the outside. It's it's essentially a, a better Jason Pierre-Paul, in my opinion, is what I think Jadavian Clowney is. No disrespect, of course, to JPP there. JPP actually had some good moments last year. But I think that Clowney at this stage in his career is better than Jason Pierre-Paul was in Baltimore signed him. He essentially plays, I believe, that role, or he could play that role for Baltimore. Clowney's a big guy, 6'5", 255 pounds. So I guess, you know, weight wise, he's a bit smaller for a defensive end, but can still play there. It's not like he gets pushed off line or anything. Now, the thing for Clowney is consistency in multiple different areas. I think the natural talent level is there. I mentioned the versatility. There are a couple of things, though, to keep in mind with Clowney and, and what he would come with. Clowney's a player that's only played in one full season over the course of his nine-year career. That was back in 2017. He is a three-time Pro Bowler, 2016, 2017, and 2018, all of those with Houston. And parlayed that into a pretty, you know, got traded to Seattle and that whole thing happened. But I think for Clowney, you're, if you sign him, you're probably going to have to account for a couple missed games. It's almost like what we talked about with Julio Jones, and we talked about Julio Jones a lot. Oh, it was <laughs> so much. We talked about Julio Jones so much. But every time it was, if the Ravens sign Julio Jones, you got to account for a couple missed games because he just gets injured. Clowney gets injured. You know, hopefully he'd put together a full 17-game season this year. But based off of track record, it, it just probably wouldn't happen over the past three seasons, played eight games, 14 games and 12 games. So it's not like he's missing, you know, three fourths of a season, but 
he is missing some time. Now, the other thing with Clowney that I actually did not know until I looked up his stats before recording the show is Clowney has never had a 10 sack season before. He, he never has. He's had three seasons of at least nine sacks, but has never hit 10. He had nine sacks in 2021 with Cleveland, had nine sacks in 2018 with Houston, and nine and a half in 2017 with Houston, but has never hit that 10 sack threshold. Also has two seasons of no sacks with both 2020 in Tennessee and his rookie season in 2014 with Houston. Those two seasons combined, though, played in only 12 games. Something else about Clowney to know is that he actually is a very good run defender. He is a he's an incredible edge setter and something with pass rushers, so, something with impact for those guys. Sometimes they can be tied to their sacks. I think sacks is what make makes them the money. Like if you look at the top pass rushing deals, the top guys on the market, those guys have consistent sack production and maybe they have a couple breakout years sack wise, but there is a lot more to a pass rusher than just sacks. People look at sack numbers and go, this guy is good or this guy is bad. That's not what that's not what this is. For example, a guy like Dewan Smoot, the sack numbers were there for him, right? 22 and a half sacks over the past four seasons. He's not a good run defender. Jadavian Clowney is a very, very good run defender and a very, very good edge setter. The Ravens haven't had, I think, a consistent edge setter. Matthew Judon did a really good job at setting the edge when he was in Baltimore. And I think Baltimore's missed that ability like consistently ever since he's left. I think if the Ravens signed Clowney, they they would add somebody who can consistently set the edge for them. You can kick him inside or outside. And it feels like the move is one that just makes a lot of sense. I think Kyle Van Noy makes a lot of sense too. But I think for the versatility that he offers, Clowney's versatility makes more sense to me than Van Noy's versatility. I would love Van Noy. If, if the Ravens do a 180 and sign Van Noy instead of Clowney, I'd be totally, totally on board with that. But it feels like Spencer Schultz, who's on the show a ton, he he's made this point, and I agree with him. The Ravens tend when when they go after players in the past, like you know when they're tied to somebody, they dip into that well a lot. And I think with Clowney again, I mentioned that sign and trade thing that almost happened in 2020 when the Ravens were trying to get him and they they couldn't end up doing it because the money just didn't line up. But the Ravens were interested in him, and, and those were rumors that were flying out there. The Ravens, it's not necessarily shocking to hear that they're interested in him. Now, the other thing with Clowney would be, what, what would the financials be on this deal? I'd assume it would be a one-year deal. I, I wouldn't anticipate anything more than that. Now, maybe if Baltimore wants a little financial flexibility that doesn't involve void years, they could make it a two-year deal and then make it a backloaded contract for trade deadline financial flexibility this season. But with Justin Houston, it felt like Baltimore just wouldn't move off of the number they thought he was worth. Houston signed a one-year deal worth up to $7 million in Carolina with $6 million guaranteed. So what does that mean for Clowney? What Would Clowney even sign for less than that? I think that my answer would probably be if, if, they're, if Clowney feels strongly about the fit then maybe he could have. If he's serious about competing, that, that's another thing. I keep saying there's this thing and that thing. A thing with Clowney is that the the work ethic has been questionable over the course of his career. It, it's just, it is what it is. There, were, there was a very weird situation in Cleveland last year where he was unhappy with his role. He didn't produce next to Miles Garrett. He thought that he should be the guy. And, and it, it was a weird situation in Tennessee. Obviously, it did not work out whatsoever. There have been some work ethic issues and just, you know, just do you want it issues with Jadavian Clowney. So hopefully Baltimore would be a place where he would want it and he would put in that work to become the player. Because look, we see that we see we've seen him produce at the NFL level. So if he signs, let's just say financials are one year, let's just do a million less than Houston. One year up to six million with five million in guaranteed or maybe it's a void year they put in there to lessen the cap hit. I don't know what they would do, but if it's a one-year deal worth $6 million, maybe they put some incentives in there to maybe protect themselves in a way. I don't know, but it feels like the Ravens have been interested in Clowney for a while. It's an opportunity for them to fill a position of need. They really do need, they really do need a veteran pass rusher at this point. I would be, I'd be a little worried if they didn't enter the year with a veteran guy, whether it is Clowney or Van Noy or somebody else, but, I think at this point, the Ravens, if they were able to get the, what essentially to me is the top edge guy left on the market, top pass rusher left on the market, you put him in a room with Rafa Owe and David Ajabo and Tyus Bowser, I feel a lot better about the defense overall and what they can do this season. So it, it feels like the move could be inevitable. If you're listening to this before he signs, we'll see what happens if you're listening to it. If, if he is signed, if, when you're listening to this, 
then, you know, seems like it's a move that the Ravens feel confident in and, and a team that Kalani feels confident in going to. But for now, at least at the time of this recording, we don't know what's going to go on. So I'm excited to see how it plays out for him. Coming up in the second part of the show, we're we'll diving into training camp notes and takeaways from Tuesday. So I appreciate a stay tuned plan to talk about on Lockdown Ravens. But first, this episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. And August is here, and you know what that means. The official start of Fantasy Football Drafting Month. Get championship ready for your home league by trying out best ball Underdog Fantasy. All you do is one live snake draft, no waivers, no trades. Underdog sets your best lineup every single week. I've done best ball before. It's it's a, it's a it's a new twist on the whole fantasy thing. It was actually very enjoyable when I did it. Try it out with Underdog's Best Ball Mania tournament. The largest fantasy football contest of all time is back and even bigger with $15 million of total prizes up for grabs including an absurd $3 million going to the winner. Underdog is the easiest place to play fantasy football and the best place for best ball and again Best Ball Mania 4 is the largest fantasy football tournament ever. The winner of Best Ball Mania 3 actually drafted their team in July so now we're August. So what are you waiting for? Visit underdog.com or find them in the app store and sign up with promo code locked on to get your first deposit doubled up to hundred dollars. That's underdog fantasy promo code locked on. We're back here. Our second segment of locked on Ravens on this Wednesday, Kevin Ostriker still here with you talking Ravens football. And let's talk Ravens training camp. The Ravens had another practice on Tuesday. We're getting closer and closer to the preseason, closer and closer to the regular season, but practice is still in full swing. And there are a lot of good takeaways to take away from Tuesday's practices. Odell Beckham was the star, actually, of the practice, which I think, again, Odell's on the rep count. He's kind of getting acclimated to the offense. But feels like he, he's found a home in Baltimore. He made a one-handed catch in the corner of the end zone and one-on-ones, and then also made a couple of grabs and team drills before pulling in a 40-yard pass from Lamar Jackson, which, again, the Ravens posted that, that long pass from Lamar to Odell is their highlight of the day. And Lamar just kind of flicks his wrist and Odell goes up there and gets the ball. Uh, Odell, I think is going to be a player that a lot of people, maybe uh, I think people in Baltimore are excited for him, but people outside of Baltimore are kind of saying, okay, Odell's kind of washed up now. They signed him to this one big deal. I think Odell is going to surprise a lot of people nationally. I think people in Baltimore though, were very excited for him to make an impact. And again, Kyle Barber, who does great work over at Baltimore beat down. He had his training camp takeaways again, absences from practice. Pepe Williams was a new absence. Trenton Simpson, Rocky C and Arthur Millette, Geno Stone were the five players who were not on the PUP or on a five list. The guys who were on those lists, JK Dobbins, Rashad Bateman on the PUP list. Injured Voorhees, Ty Bowser, Nick Moore, all on the NFI list. Trent Simpson has a soft tissue injury, Rocky Essie and a knee injury, Arthur Millette, a hamstring injury, and Geno Stone, an ankle injury there. And it seems like Trayvon Mullen will be out for the season with a toe injury. He's having toe surgery, so just an update on him. I was actually kind of excited for Trayvon Mullen there. Odell Beckham, again, though, he was the star of everything Kyle said. And there was a lot to like from Odell. And the thing that's really good about this, too, is Odell was one-on-one with Marlon Humphrey. And he is one-on-one with Marlon Humphrey for a lot of these. Both battled for the ball, one of the balls, but Beckham ended up coming down with it. And fans are excited. It seems like every time Odell makes a play, the crowd erupts, which is really, really cool. And for Odell, the thing that Kyle noticed and something other people have noticed too is how Odell catches with his hands, right? He's not really a body catcher. He extends his arms and catches the football and he doesn't necessarily wait for it, but he goes up there, he you know, gets it with his hands, and that's really cool. Melvin Gordon was somebody who had a good day, according to Kyle. It was a good day for Melvin Gordon on the football field. Gordon ended up gashing linebacker Josh Ross on a slant route, and then it, it's really exciting. That uh, I think for me, we heard yesterday that Justice Hill and Keaton Mitchell both caught passes. It feels like the Ravens are really putting an emphasis with, you know, we hear Gordon and we hear Mitchell and we hear Hale and Gus Edwards, et cetera. feels like Baltimore's really putting an emphasis on the running backs catching passes out of the backfield. During 11 on 11, Joel's Gordon was featured as a rushing back and a receiver out of the backfield too. He beat Delson Phillips for a first down catch and, He ended up receiving the most rushing plays during 11 on 11s. And that means that according to Kyle, that means they want to see what he can offer. And also John Harbaugh highlighted him as well. Mark Andrews had a good day where Kyle Hamilton had a lot of reps against Mark Andrews that Kyle Hamilton won, but Mark Andrews ended up showing what he was able to do. And we we know Mark Andrews is able to do. He had a route on Kyle Hamilton that Kyle Hamilton was trailing on. And Andrews ended up breaking a tackle and gaining two yards for a first down on a third and nine. 
And Andrews came down with the ball during one-on-ones against Kyle Hamilton as well. Love the notes Kyle had is that Patrick Queen and Ardarius Washington blew up a second down for the offense, and that forced Lamar Jackson to throw the ball into the dirt. Tyler Huntley had a very nice deep ball to Tylen Wallace on undrafted cornerback Jordan Swan. Brandon Stevens ended up struggling during one-on-one sessions, but he came up big with a pass breakup on Tark Black in 11-on-11 drills. Gus Edwards ran an out route that Tyler Huntley tossed a little bit high and ahead of Edwards, but... Edwards actually snatched the ball from going incomplete and kept the play alive to gain a chunk of yardage. Goes back to my point about the running backs out of the backfield there. Kyle Hamilton sacks Lamar Jackson on a blitz from the edge near the 30-yard line. Josh Johnson found a running lane on third and 11. So feels like Baltimore is trying to incorporate a lot. And also the Baltimore banner had great reactions as well and great notes from the day as well as Lamar Jackson was 25 of 34 unofficially and also threw a touchdown with no interceptions. A big point in practice yesterday was the fact that the quarterbacks actually had the wristbands out. So there was a huge point made about Todd Munkin not having the quarterbacks wear those wristbands, learning the offense just without them. But that did change on Tuesday. Patrick Ricard, we talked about him yesterday. If you want a more in-depth analysis on Patrick Ricard and his possible positional switch. Be sure to check out yesterday's show. He ended up continuing to work with the offensive line as he explores a positional switch. Daryl Worley punched out a football on Charlie Kohler and Jordan Swan recovered that fumble. Corey Mayfield Jr. had a diving pass breakup on a pass intended for Tariq Black. And also the defense didn't allow any large gains for the running backs after a few days that had a pretty nice spark from the Ravens running game, which was nice to, it's nice both ways, right? I think in training camp, you want to have the offense win some days and the defense win some days. You want to have both units with consistency, with confidence, but also being able to understand where they're struggling and where they can get better. Some one-on-one highlights noted in the Baltimore Banner article here is Dante Demas Jr. made a leaping grab over the head of Kavon Seymour. Kavon Seymour's had a great camp, so Demas doing that is really nice. Demas is a huge target, someone who can play big, and I'm, I'm still a huge Dante Demas guy. Nelson Aguilar had a, a rep where he tried to juke out Marlon Humphrey a lot, and Humphrey ended up just, you know, being like, okay, and it didn't even phase him, and the ball wasn't even thrown because Aguilar couldn't even shake Marlon Humphrey there. James Proche snatched the ball over the outstretched arms of Ardarius Washington. Makai Polk beat Brandon Stevens on a comeback route. Caillou Kelly had a few good reps. Ronnie Stanley ended up winning against Malik Ham. And then you also have the one-on-ones, you know, offensive lineman versus defensive lineman. Fashion McCary got the best of Tavius Robinson. Sala ended up getting a lesson from the offensive line coach, Joe D'Alessandris, after he allowed Brent Urban to get too far upfield. Just amount of BKs, just pushing guys all around. He, he ends up overpowering an undrafted lineman. John Simpson ended up forcing a stalemate with Travis Jones, but Jones celebrated like he ended up winning the rep. So it's really nice. Again, there are a lot of players stepping up in training camp so far. Both units are having their fair share of success in their fair share of struggles, which I think, again, it's good not to be too up or too down in training camp. Right now, we're still, you know, we're just a couple weeks in right now. We haven't even played a preseason game yet. So I, I think for Baltimore, as they get further into training camp, as the preseason goes on, you get the joint practices with the commanders as well. We'll, le- we'll learn more and more about these guys, but trends are starting to form. Risers and fallers are, are starting to really establish themselves. Not that it's the be-all, end-all, and rosters, b- roster spots are decided today. They're not. But I think that there there is a point into what some of these guys are doing and some of the camps that players are having. And we'll see how they continue to respond over the course of the next couple of days and a couple of weeks as the preseason rolls around. Coming up in the final part of our show, we'll be talking about the unofficial depth chart that Baltimore released on Tuesday, getting into some takeaways from that. So be sure to stay tuned. A lot still to get to on Locked on Raven. We're back here, our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still here with you on this Wednesday. I appreciate everybody who is listening to me here today and has listened to me, whether you've been with me every single day. If this is your first time into the channel of the show, welcome in. Or again, if you're somewhere in the middle, I appreciate your support as well. We're coming up on the day of four years for me at Locked On Ravens hosting and producing this show. We're not quite there yet, but we are very close. So again, it's just all the support that's happened, the way that the show has grown. It's not possible without without all the listeners, all the watchers. So I'm so, so grateful and so, so appreciative. But let's now get into football. Let's talk Ravens unofficial depth chart takeaways. Now, whenever the Ravens or any NFL team releases these depth charts, they they really don't mean much of anything. It's not like the team is 
going over everything and releasing their final depth chart based off of a couple weeks. It's not even, it's not released by the coaching staff. It's released by the public relations staff. So it, it, if anything, it's a guess, but you, we can still talk about it. We can still take away. So some of the big takeaways that we'll just go offense, defense, and obviously we cannot forget about special teams, but quarterback, no surprise, Lamar Jackson, Tyler Huntley, Josh Johnson, Anthony Brown. It's kind of trended that way. I kind of had, well, before training camp, I thought it was going to be Anthony Brown, Josh Johnson for three, four, but definitely feels like Josh Johnson has taken the reins from Anthony Brown. We haven't really heard a ton about him this offseason. Running back, though, was a big one because Gus Edwards is over J.K. Dobbins, and then it's Justice Hill, and then it's the rest, Melvin Gordon, Keaton Mitchell, and Owen Wright. I mean, it makes sense that Edwards is number one. Dobbins hasn't practiced at training camp at all with the reported holding and everything. So I'm not overly shocked this is the case, but again, this is a point that the Ravens made on here that, you know, Edwards is the guy over Dobbins right now. And I think that when Dobbins returns, it'll be that way until he gets fully up to speed. Fullback, no surprise. Patrick Ricard, one. Ben Mason, two. But we'll see how that plays out with Ricard's potential positional switch. Wide receiver, though, is interesting. We have Odo Beckham is the first wide receiver, one. Rashad Bateman is the first wide receiver, two. I know that there's been some debate about whether Rashad or Odell's wide receiver, one versus wide receiver, two. Odell gets the nod here, and then Bateman is two. Now, Zay Flowers is the third option. He is the second option of wide receiver, one. Then Nelson Aguilar and Devin Duvernay are both the second wide receiver, two options. So, I guess not a lot of separate. I mean, it feels like Aguilar separated himself from Duvernay, to me at least, but... Baltimore, I think, does still value him. And then if you're going off the depth chart, Laquan Treadwell is the sixth wide receiver. And sometimes how these things work, in fact, I think a lot of the time how they work, is these unofficial depth charts will prioritize veterans in spots where there might be a log jam. So th- it's not a surprise. You know, the fourth uh, the fourth options are James Perche, sorry, Black, Makai Polk, Tylen Wallace, Shamar Bridges, Dante Dimas, Sean Ryan. So I'm not necessarily shocked that Laquan Treadwell is there. But if I if I had to predict right now, I would say it's probably between Treadwell and Tylen Wallace. Offensive line, left tackle. Well, we'll just go starters first. Ronnie Stanley, John Simpson gets the left guard nod over Sala. Then Tyler Linderbaum at center, Kevin Zeitler at right guard, and Morgan Moses at right tackle. And then the second stringers is Patrick McCary at left tackle. Sala, second option at left guard. Sam Mustafer is the second option at center. Ben Cleveland, second option at right guard. And Daniel Falele, the backup at right tackle. Then you have the undrafted players such as Jalen Thomas, Deshaun Manning, Tykeem Doss, Jake Guidon, and then Andrew Voorhees is on the NFI list. He's the fourth option on the offensive line. Tight end wise, no surprise at all. Mark Andrews, Isaiah Likely, Charlie Kohler, Travis Vokalek. I expect all four of those guys in Ravens uniforms, three on the roster, one on the practice squad. Vokalek being the guy on the practice squad. So, you know, tight end wise, I I think that's pretty much how I expected to go. Now, defensively, defensive line, starters, Justin Matabike is starting defensive tackle, Michael Pierce starting nose tackle, Roderick Washington the starting defensive end. Now, the second string defensive tackle is Angelo Blackson, followed by the second string nose tackle being Travis Jones, second string defensive end being Brent Urban, then Rayshad Nichols, Kaim Caesar, and Trey Botts as the third guys there. Now the rush linebacker spot goes to Adafi Owe, followed by David Ajabo, followed by Tavius Robinson, followed by Kaylee Sanders. The Sam linebacker spot, Tyus Bowser, Jeremiah Moon, Malik Ham. So if Kyle Van Noy signs with the Ravens, I'd expect Kyle Van Noy to be the second Sam option. If Jadavian Clowney signs, I'd expect him to be probably put into the defensive end slot where Broderick Washington is, or maybe as the rush linebacker, who knows. Middle linebackers, you have, Pat, you have Roquan Smith as middle linebacker, Patrick Queen as the will linebacker, then Malik Harrison, second string middle linebacker, Doshawn Phillips, second string will linebacker, Josh Ross, third string middle linebacker, Trenton Simpson, third string will linebacker, and then Kristen Welch, fourth string middle linebacker. Doshawn Phillips has made a name for himself over the course of training camp, would not be shocked if he makes this roster here. Now, corner-wise, you have Marlon Humphrey and Rocky Essien as your two starters, Pepe Williams and Jalen Armour Davis are mentioned as the two backups. Kevon Seymour and Arthur Millette as the third stringers. And then fourth stringers are Kyle Kelly, Jeremy Lucian, Corey Mayfield Jr., and Jordan Swan. Safety, free safety, strong safety is Marcus Williams, Kyle Hamilton, respectively. Backup free safety, Brandon Stevens. Backup strong safety, Geno Stone. Then an interesting one is that third string free safety is Daryl Worley and Third string strong safety is Jaquan Amos. And then fourth string free safety is Ardarius Washington. So I think the Ravens are going to continue to mix and match their secondary guys like Adara Worley, Ardarius Washington, Brandon Stevens, et cetera. We'll see how those guys all kind of filter in there as well. Then special teams, no surprises whatsoever. 
Jordan Stout, Justin Tucker, and Tyler Ott are the three punter, kicker, long snapper, respectively. Jordan Stout, the holder as well. Kick returner, Devin Duvernay. Punt returner, Devin Duvernay. Now backup, kick returner, Justice Hill. Backup, punt returner, James Perche. Third string kick returner is James Perche. And third string punt returner is actually Zay Flowers. Then Keaton Mitchell is both a fourth string kick returner and punt returner. And Owen Wright is a fourth string kick returner. So it's, it's again, not, nothing really too crazy to take away. It's, again, made by the PR staff, not by the coaching staff. It's more so just getting a depth chart out there. So as the Ravens continue to go through training camp, as the preseason goes on as well, we'll start to get a clearer understanding of how this depth chart actually looks. And again, I'm not like, no no one needs to go out there and blame the PR staff for this if it's not accurate in a couple of weeks. Because again, it's, it's just a guessing game right now. It's not all that serious, but it, it is something to note is how I'll put it there. But that's all I have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm going to get back here tomorrow. It's more Ravens content from us. So be sure to stay tuned. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens.